Who knows what show this is from? No, never seen it. So it's a, ah, yeah, quite a few. So it's a show in the UK um, called Little Britain. And if you haven't seen this sketch, uh, you've probably experienced this, this thing in real life where you're speaking to a human in, let's say, a bank or an insurance agency or a travel agency, and you're about to get what you want. And then all of a sudden, the, the person that you're speaking to says, hmm, the computer says no. You can't have this thing that you thought you were going to have and that I thought you were going to have. And what is frustrating about that is that um, the face-to-face, the -face warm, human-to-human -human contact that you had is now broken. The computer has put an end to that conversation. And uh, she doesn't have any power to change it. And in fact, maybe she doesn't even understand why you have been denied a credit card or a seat on this plane or, or whatever. So I'm going to make the case during this talk that what is a mild irritant with, with uh, situations like this is actually going to get more and more serious as the things that AIs do for us become more and more impactful on our lives. Um, so I'm going to quickly um, review what we've been doing at Wealth Wizards with this. So we work in financial services. Um, what, what have we done? How, we, how have we been able to use uh, explainable AI? And that's kind of a case study that we can generalize to all professions. Then we're going to dig into uh, an algorithm, which is one of the leading algorithms for, for providing uh, explainability to your models called Lime. Uh, and then we'll have a look at the, you know, the ethical considerations around making your models um, explainable. So just quickly then, what, what we do is help people to figure out what to do with their finances over the long term. You know, if, they, if they're trying to figure out how do I save off my daughter's wedding, or how do I pay off my student loan, or you know, how do I prepare for my, for my pension in, the, in Britain, actually we're terrible at all of those things. But you can imagine that any advice that we give to people is majorly impactful on their life. And so if we were to say to them, um, you should take your money out of this thing and put it in this thing, or you shouldn't pay off your student loan for a while, you should do this other thing instead then, of course, they're well within their rights to say, well, why, why do you say that? And why do you say that specifically to me? You know, do you say the same thing to everybody? Or has this thing been tailored to, you know, to my personal circumstances? And um, the, the, the advice that we're giving is, is delivered um, either direct to consumer through, um, you know, through some kind of app or through a paraprofessional of some kind. So a paraprofessional is somebody who's not fully qualified in an area, so is not a fully qualified um, financial advisor, for example, but who works for financial advisors. And with their qualifications that they have and, their, and, and the AI supporting them, they're able to give advice to the same level as as any kind of uh, fully qualified advisor. So that's a thing that we can generalize to lots of different professions. Um, this study that, um, that is on the screen there has been done by um, somebody who's uh, a very long, long standing lawyer and his son, who's a, a fellow of economics at Oxford, uh, Oxford University. And they've said that um, actually what is happening in financial services is happening across all professions, that slowly this um, monopoly that professionals have on a, on a particular body of information is eroding as people are able to get information from, um, not just information, but practical expertise from, um, from the internet and from AI systems. And so there are medical systems now that can, that can tell um, better than human experts whether this thing on your skin is a melanoma or not. Uh, we've, we've got systems that can give you legal advice. We've got systems that um, can tell, tell you how to architect your house. And of course, any, any advice that you take in any of those areas is going to have a huge impact on your life. And so you're going to want to know, OK, what specifically? Can you explain what are the steps that you took to arrive at that advice? And why should I trust you? Trust is a theme that we're going to come back to a bit later. So typically, when, when we're choosing a, a model, we, you know, we have to make a trade-off between do we want this model to be explainable or do we want it to be really accurate and, and powerful? And over at one end of the spectrum, you've got decision trees where you know, it's very easy to see. OK, I can see that somebody asked a, a customer that question. They answered this thing. They went down that branch. And then they went down this other branch and, and so on. And that's, <clears throat> that's explainable. Uh, the same goes for linear regression. But once you get all the way over to the other end of the spectrum, to neural networks, then if somebody were to say, OK, so you're telling me that I should um, get a divorce, or you're telling me that um, I now have to go to prison, tell me why you had to do that, then a neural network's explanation is, well, there's your massive tensor full of theta values. Work that out for yourself. <clears throat> but 
that doesn't need to be the case. So the, the field of explainable AI allows you to choose whichever model you want to use and then tack on an explainer as like a post-processing step. Um, so in this example, we've got um, uh, a model which is saying that we think this person has flu. Uh, so the doctor would normally prescribe a particular piece of action. But as a proper professional, he wants to know, well, you know, how do we know? You tell me and I'll make my own decision. So he, in order for him to be uplifted, his skills to be uplifted by, by the AI, he wants to know, can you explain your reasoning? And so an explainer module would pull out the, the two or three factors or the four or five factors which are most relevant, which were weighted most highly um, in this. So there's a few different ways of, of achieving this, this goal. And one of the most popular ones, which we're going to talk about today, is LIME, which stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explainer. Um, and if you Google that, uh, that phrase there, why should I trust you, that will lead you to the, uh, the paper itself. So the way LIME works, again, it's like a post-processing step, is it, um, it tries to work out what, is the, what, what factors are being taken into account, what features are being weighted most heavily in a particular local area of your model. So if that boundary there, that, that blue and pink boundary, represents the, the decision boundary between two different classes, uh, the crosses and the, and the circles, then the explainer is not able to, you know, is, is not aware of that. That's invisible to the explainer. But somehow it's got to try and figure out, why did you say that this guy had flu? Or why did you say that this guy shouldn't be granted parole? So in this, obviously in this model, you'll forgive me if I'm only talking in two dimensions um, with two classes, but we can see how this extrapolates. In this case, the, the largest cross on the screen there is the instance that we want explained. So we've gone away and we've trained a model. We've passed one instance through the model, and that's given us a classification, classification K. And we then want to see, right, what are the main factors that were taken into account in there? In a neural network, there might be you know, dozens or tens or thousands of, of, uh, of classes. What were the main ones that led to this decision? And the way that Lime works is it takes the features of the instance that you just passed in and modulates them. So it jiggles them up and down, and it tries to measure so it will jiggle, let's say, the age or the, uh, the amount of sneezing that somebody's doing or uh, the, how violent somebody's been in prison. It will take that metric and jiggle it up and down and see when it then passes it through the original model. Does that change uh, what, the, what the class is? And you can see the things that are, are close to the big red um, X um, <clears throat> lie on one side of the boundary or the other side of the boundary. And there'll be certain features that you can tweak that will push the thing over into the other classification. And you know, so that so Lime starts to get a feel for. Oh, I see. So small modulations on this one feature make a big difference to the classification, whereas massive modulations to this other feature. So you can see the tiny little X's way, way, way over there on the right, um, way, way, way over there on the right. They um, they're not making much of a difference at all. So there are X's even though they're way over there. So it'll take all of these uh, all of these features, modulate them uh, to produce classifications, and then at that local point, and this is this is the key bit, we'll train a more explainable model. So let's say a linear classifier or a logistic regression to see uh, can we see any pattern here, and that's that's how it learns which features are the most interesting, and um, in. Later on in the in the paper, they talk about how you can you can then rank. So that will give you some expl explanation. But there are then ways of trying out lots of different types of models against each other, and then ranking them against how complex they are. So that where you know if you've got ten features, that's more complex than a model with with four features. So it can help you try out multiple different ways of explaining the same thing using decision trees, linear regression, uh, logistic regression, and so on. So that's how it works with. Uh, logical data, um, but this can also be used with, it can be used with any model. That's what the M in LIME stands for, model agnostic. Um, so in, in convolutional um, image data, for example, the way that we, that we apply the same algorithm is to um, take pixels, where the, you know, the, the features in this case are pixels, take those and turn those on and off and jiggle windows of pixels at a time to see if we can find, are there, are there features in here that we think help us to classify this Labrador playing the guitar as a Labrador playing the guitar. Um, so that they're what the paper calls uh, super pixels. And we can see from the, you know, from the, the first uh, image uh, that's grayed out, so they've turned off a whole bunch of the pixels and, and figured out that this thing that looks like a fretboard looks pretty much like an electric guitar, whereas the things that 
um, the body of the guitar look more like an acoustic guitar, and this cute little nose and the ears and the kind of smiley face, well, they look like a Labrador. So that kind of thing is super understandable to anybody who's not um, an expert in, in machine learning. You don't need to be a, an expert in machine learning to understand that. And in fact, um, there, are, there are techniques uh, explored later on, which we don't have time to talk about now, where you can get non-expert humans to improve the, the, um, the accuracy of the model itself. Um, over time, you can say, this thing's not helpful, this thing is helpful, and, and help the model itself to, to improve. So let's just have a look at uh, some, some code for how that, that works. The code for this is pretty simple, um, to, to get started with at least. We've got this um, Alaskan Husky, I think it is, sitting there with a cat, and we want to pass this into, into um, Google's uh, Inception uh, classifier to see what it makes of that. And quite quickly it comes back with, uh, yeah, I think that's an, an, an Alaskan Husky. But the important thing that we want to focus on is how does it know? So there's a couple of lines at the end there, and I wish now I'd put line numbers on, uh, on my code. The two lines at the end are where we set up the line classifier. And remember that I said what we're doing is we're, we're giving it an image and passing it through the model again and seeing what it comes out with. So the image that we give to the line classifier, the line classifier is then going to jiggle around all of those features, in this case, turn groups of pixels on and off to see what it comes out with. And we can then paint the area of the, you know, the, the pixels that are most important onto the image so that we get a feel for uh, you know, what that looks like. So those, you know, just in those four lines there of, uh, of Jupyter code, we've managed to, uh, to identify that this is an Alsatian. No, what was it? Some husky of some kind. <clears throat> so these, these kinds of models help, help to build trust in, uh, in the model. And trust is, is important to, to a lot of different stakeholders, actually, in, in this argument. Um, in, in, in the kinds of fields that we've spoken about, so um, you know, in crime, so in the criminal justice system, or in, um, in, in medicine, or in financial advice, obviously, the end consumer is very, very interested in, well, you say that. You say that I should make these major changes in my life, but how, you know, how, how can I trust that? Um, they, they need more than just a yes or no answer or, or a set of things that they need to follow. And so this, <clears throat> okay, this is quite rudimentary at the moment, but you can see where this is going. These ways of speaking to, to our customers will help them to build confidence in our model. In areas where you've got para professionals, so you might have doctors powered up by using uh, AIs, or you might have architects who they just get an AI to, to design a, a set of houses. Or in the case that you've got um, you know, a judge taking advice from, from an AI. They want to be sure that not just the individual um, predictions are correct, they want to be sure that the whole model is correct. And so Lime gives you a way of, uh, of, of choosing a whole bunch of cases, run them through the system to see how does the system, how does this model perform as a whole? Is that something I can trust? If not, is it something I can improve on so that I can trust it? Or should I choose another model altogether? Then you've got, uh, you've got regulators. So in lots of industries, like aviation, for example, you've got aviators who are interested in um, why things are working the way they are. And you know, th so think of a self-driving car. Um, if, that, uh, if that has had an accident, that's run into somebody, what, were the, what, were the, what was the thought-making process that the AI ran through um, to make the decision to run into that pedestrian? And you, you can imagine that at the moment, we've, we've got the, the data in a format that um, the manufacturers can understand. But wouldn't it be better if we had it in a format that other people who were interested in the safety of humans could understand, they, who, people who are incentivized by different motives in a format that they could understand? And then you've got ethics bodies. <clears throat> Let me just skip through to this. Um, so I thought this was a, a really interesting quote. IBM think they've got a classifier that can tell the difference between uh, a refugee and a terrorist. And once we start getting into the, you know, this kind of world, that's quite a scary world that we, want to, that, that we live in, that we want people to be able to have quite sharp scrutiny on those, on those types of, uh, um, you know, on that kind of research. And I personally would like that kind of scrutiny to be more well-informed than the, the kind of scrutiny that Mark Zuckerberg was, uh, was undergoing when he was speaking to the, to the American Congress. That, that question was quite woolly, and when we're talking about autonomous weapons, and when we're talking about uh, classification of, of peoples and, and races and stuff, I want the questioning to be very pointed. And so, the, you know, having an explainable AI that, that is understandable by, by ethics bodies, I think, is, is really, really crucial. 
So pe people are, are, are in two minds. Non-experts non are in two minds about where all of this is going. You know, they, did, did you see the thing in, um, in the news recently that an Alexa w was uh, recording a conversation I think they were talking about their, their nanny, and it sent the conversation to their nanny, and everybody was embarrassed. And then there were things in the papers all over the place saying, are we being too complacent about AI? Is AI going to take over, the, ruin our way of life? Um, you've, got, you've got massive pessimists on one side and massive uh, optimists on the other side. Um, where, where is this going? Are we leading to a utopia or a dystopia? And I think the more clarity that we can shed on how our models work and what AI really is under the hood, the more we're going to convince people that this is really a utopia. We stand a chance of making the world much better through AI if we all understand it. Thanks.